wanted to build on the message that Brad had given. If you haven't heard it, it was about the promises of God. And everything that we're going to go into today is connected to that idea that God keeps his promises and therefore we rest in that and therefore we have hope when we go through times of suffering. So the main passage we're going to focus on is going to be Romans 5, 1 through 5, but we're going to build momentum from chapter 4 and work our way through that because Paul is taking certain ideas from that passage and he's taking that, hoping you'll keep that in mind by the time you get to Romans 5 because Romans 5, 1 through 5, is written in light of the truths that come before. So that's where we're going to go, but we're going to start a little further back and then work our way to that as our main passage. So before we start, let's pray together that the Lord would bless his word. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would bless your word, that your word would take its effect in us, that I would be faithful in teaching, and that I would not be a barrier to faithful teaching of your word. And I pray that we would be affected today by these amazing truths that you have for your people, that they would come alive to us, that you would be the true and living God, the faithful promise keeper, that we would not just study the Old Testament stories as if they're just some old, antiquated, historical documents, but that we would see you as the true and living, miraculous, supernatural, sovereign Lord today. That We serve the same God, the God of Abraham. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So one of the ideas I want to establish before we get to Romans 5 is that Abraham, in many ways, represents your story. And Paul brings this up many times again and again. He talks about Abraham was given promises. You were given promises. Abraham was given an inheritance. Through him, you were given an inheritance. Abraham received righteousness by faith, and you receive righteousness by faith. Abraham went through trials and, and suffering, and you're going to go through trials and suffering, but God will keep his promises. And sometimes, like Abraham, you're going to waver with some doubt. But overall, the trajectory of your life is going to be one of always trusting, always believing. Though there's moments you stumble, you're going to be like Abraham too if you belong to the same God. And so we need to understand the story of Abraham to understand why Paul then shifts all of a sudden in Romans 5, where he starts Romans 5 saying, therefore. And we need to understand what the therefore is therefore, because whenever there's a, the word for or therefore, it means in light of what I've just said, the following is true for you. And so we're going we're gonna to go back to the therefore part of Romans 5, all the information that you need to take with you by the time you come to Romans 5 so that you can understand why we now rejoice in our sufferings like Abraham. So if you would turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 4, starting at verse 13, this is where we're going to begin because this is the therefore part of Romans 5 verse 1. And Paul writes this, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. I want to pause right there and make a little comment. One of the things the Jews would constantly focus on, besides the righteousness that God wanted them to have, was the promises of the law. The law, we see this, I think it's in Leviticus 17, for sure I know it's in Deuteronomy 28. The law said, if you obey, if you walk righteously before me, if you do not fail to keep all of these laws, I will bless you, I will give you this land, I will establish you. And so, 
in the relationship that we have with God, one of the blessings is an inheritance, that we are sons of the people of God. We are or sons of God, that we are heirs of the promises of God. And all this time, the Jews have been trying to, uh, to gain the blessing, to gain the promises through the law, because the law promised that we would be heirs. So when Jesus comes, Jesus begins to open our eyes and see that we can't obey the law to get the blessings. And yet you still see, after Jesus does his work and the disciples ask him before he's ascended into heaven, they said, well, now will you establish the land? Now will you give us the promises? Now can we have the blessings? See, God's message to his people is not just one of giving us righteousness. God also has promises that accompany the relationship he has with us. God also promises that we will be heirs. And this too is part of our relationship with God. So how are we going to get it? Notice the disciples said, now will you give us the kingdom? And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the time. And then he says, see ya, and he leaves. And they don't get the land but they know that the land is part of the promise. So the point that I want to make here is that the gospel does not just give us righteousness. The gospel is not just about the forgiveness of sins. The gospel includes that, and it's never less than that. But the gospel always includes more than that. The gospel is going to declare you righteous. The gospel is going to change who you are. The gospel is going to give you the spirit by the power of the spirit. You're going to walk in obedience. You're going to have uh, a new understanding. You're going to have power to proclaim his word. You're going to have a security that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion and you're going to have the promises of the future that you're going to inherit. All of that comes in the gospel. The gospel is not just about justification. So Abraham believed the gospel and he was not only declared to be righteous, but he also received all of God's promises by faith. We can't gain the promises of Abraham through the law. It's not like the gospel is one way to get righteousness and then we got to find another way to get all the other promises. It's all packaged. All the promises of God are packaged in Jesus Christ and are all given by faith. That's what it says here. If you read that again, verse 13, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be, watch this, heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Abraham didn't even have the law because it came 420 years later. And so the law could not be the basis of his gaining the inheritance. The gospel was how he gained the inheritance. How do we know that Abraham believed the gospel? Well, we know this because the same author who writes Romans is Paul, who write, also writes Galatians. And in Galatians 3, 7 through 9, it says, Know then that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham and Scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, that's us, by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham. The gospel was preached beforehand to Abraham, saying, and you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So the message Abraham believed was the, was the gospel. So Paul is saying here in Romans 4.13 that Abraham believed the gospel and he received all of God's promises. And he didn't even need to go to the law because he didn't even have it. And this is the faith we're called to have. And these are the promises we are to receive, not just being forgiven for our sins, but everything that God has for his people comes through the gospel, just like Abraham. Might ask a question here. How many of God's promises come through the gospel? Well, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 1.20. Paul says, and I'm, I'm quoting here, all the promises of God 
find their yes in him, in Christ. All that God promised came through Christ. And there are movements out there that say, yes, we believe in justification by faith in Jesus Christ alone, but we need to go back to the law in order to obtain all the other promises, in order to take possession of the land now. If we, if we just make the nations more righteous, if we take possession of these, these, these nations and submit them under God's law, we'll finally take possession of the land. And, and God is saying, you already are an heir of the land through faith in Jesus Christ. And Hebrews 11 tells us it is yet to come when Jesus returns, but it's ours through faith in the gospel. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever teach that only justification comes by faith. All of God's promises come by faith, every single one of them. And, and this helps to explain what the Galatians heresy was, because there are a lot of people who look at what's going on in Galatia, and they're trying to figure out, was, was Paul dealing with people who didn't believe in justification by faith alone? Because there's a lot of evidence that those people did. But those people also didn't believe that all the promises of Abraham came through faith in the gospel. And Paul says, when you do this, it's another gospel. Everything that God has to offer to his people comes through faith in Jesus Christ. So back to our text in, in Romans 4, verse 14. For if it is adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. In other words, before you believed the gospel, you were judged by the law. But now that you believe the gospel, it's as if you, you're, no, you're no longer under the law. You're no longer being judged by it. And there's, there's, there's some dispute over what this verse 15 says. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. And, and some people are trying to go, well, what, what does Paul mean here? And I think where Paul is making a contrast that this, come, this can't come from the law. This comes from the gospel. If you're under the law, there's... There's sin that you're judged by if you're going to live by the law. But if there is no law, then there is no sin. I think what Paul is saying here is that when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, it's as if the law doesn't exist. And therefore, there's no sin accounted to you. Now, that doesn't mean that the law doesn't represent the righteous standards of God. It doesn't mean that we can't go to the law to be sanctified and to become more Christ-like. But the law is not what is the standard of our relationship. The law is not how God judges our standing before him and our relationship with him. The gospel is, the work of Jesus Christ is, that we receive by faith. And God's not going to let you earn his promises. God's promises are always received by faith. That's Paul's point starting in verse 16. Verse 16, that is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace. This promise, he's not just talking about justification here. The promise to Abraham that through you all nations would be blessed, that, that, that through you you would be heirs of the land. All this is promised in the gospel received by faith. So this is in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, in other words, to the Jews who have the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, that is, we believing Gentiles, who is the father of us all. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Paul does a lot of things where he's thinking stuff and he just starts spouting off stuff and you don't always know what he's thinking. Why did he just go into this statement like in the presence of God whom he believed who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist? Like, what? 
but it connects us to the story of Abraham because we know in, in Hebrews, when Abraham was about to offer his son Isaac, it says, Abraham considered that God could raise the dead and he was willing to offer up his son Isaac. That's why Abraham had boldness to obey God because he considered that God not only made promises, but that God was the creative God. God was the almighty God who could raise the dead. And therefore he trusted God and was going to obey and sacrifice his son if God had even let him because he assumed that God had the ability to raise the dead. But what about this part where it says, and he calls into existence the things that do not exist? Why, why does Paul point that out? Well, Paul's about to go to this story of Sarah, because Sarah is as good as dead. He is as good as dead. You're, the older you get, the more dead you feel. And what is God going to do? He's going to take from nothing and create something. God doesn't look around and go, well, I need something to work with here, people. God creates the something to work with. That's what Paul is trying to say. If you look around in your life and you say, Lord, what door do I go through? There are no doors. God makes the doors, and we walk through that door. God doesn't need it to exist in order to use it. He makes what he needs. He creates it out of nothing. He takes what is dead, and he raises it up. Because he is the God who can do that. So the story of Abraham is for both Jews and Gentiles. Like Abraham, everyone who trusts God is justified, but also enters into his promises. Everyone who trusts God benefits from this supernatural power. That's what Paul is trying to say. Not only do you get justified, not only do you get to be an heir, but the power of God is now working in your life. Like Abraham, when God said, through you many nations will be blessed, through your wife Sarah a child will be born, that wasn't possible by human means. But God, the living God, the true and supernatural working God, was going to make it happen. So Abraham believed in the God who raises the dead, and you are to believe in the same God. And Paul's saying this life-giving God of Abraham is the same God who's going to help you today. Second, Abraham believed in God who creates things out of nothing. And you believe in the same God. You serve the same God. Paul is saying that Abraham trusted that God could make things appear out of nothing. In other words, God doesn't need something to exist in order to make it happen. He just makes it exist. He makes it happen. And he does that, so who gets the glory? He does. God doesn't look at the world as it, it, it exists. He looks at the world that he's going to make, that he's going to create out of nothing. He opens doors where none exist. He creates the doors when there aren't doors. He strengthens the weak and the frail. And that's the God we trust. That's what Paul's trying to say. He's not just going back to a history lesson at Abraham. And so many times we read like story Bibles to our kids and we grew up with that with story Bibles. And the moral of the lesson is be like Abraham or be like David or be like Joseph. And we're not seeing God in the story. The Old Testament is the story of God working through his people despite themselves. God's trying to show you, you're like David. You're the, the youngest, least likely to be king. You're probably shorter than your brothers. And I'm going to put my spirit in you, and then I'm going to move you to be bold as a lion. See, the story of of David and Goliath isn't you need to find your Goliath and, and find your stone that you hurl at your Goliath. The story of David and Goliath is this is what happens when God puts his spirit in his people. You see the same thing happening with Peter. Before he receives the spirit, what do we see? We see, Lord, even if everyone else betrays you, I won't betray you. And then 
Jesus is betrayed, and Peter runs. And then after Pentecost, Peter receives the Holy Spirit. And the same leaders come to get him. And Peter is as bold as a lion. Why? Because he, like David, received the Spirit of God. That's why Jesus says, don't even go and try to testify to people until you've been clothed with power from on high. That's the God we serve. That's the God of Abraham. He's the God who works by supernatural means. This is, this is what Abraham believed about God. This is the kind of faith Abraham had. He didn't just believe that God existed. He didn't just believe that God was very accurate at predicting the future. He believed that God could make it happen. And this is why it says in verse 18, it says, in hope, he, Abraham, believed against hope. This is, notice how he believes. He believes against hope. That's going to come up in Romans 5, that we are being brought to a place of hope because we serve the same God of Abraham. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offsprings be. And he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead. See the connection where Paul had just said, you know, he raises the dead and he makes something out of nothing that's why Paul said that, because he was preparing you for what he was going to say about Abraham. So you understand, this is the God Abraham had in mind. It says, he did not weaken in his faith when he considered his own body, he was, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. There's the, there's the God can make something out of nothing. Verse 20, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promises of God but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. You're going to see this as we go to Romans 5. It's like when we go through suffering, we grow in endurance. When we endure, like Abraham, we gain character. When we gain character, like Abraham, we gain hope because we serve the same God who's going to move us through all the obstacles of our life to all the barrenness in our life because this God will raise the dead and create what doesn't exist open doors or create the doors that he opens. He does this. He's the same God that we serve. It's not that, well, this is how it was in the Old Testament. Oh, well, this is how it was when the apostles were around. No, this is how God is now. He's the true and living God now. And that's what Paul is trying to tell you. Otherwise, why would Paul tell us the story of Abraham and say, this is what God did for Abraham. This is what he did with Peter. But he doesn't do that anymore. Go and be encouraged. The Lord bless you. You know, you filled with all this academic knowledge about God. Great. No, he's a true and living God today. Verse 20, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Which is also why Paul's going to say in Romans 5, we rejoice in our hope in the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. God is glorious. You know what glory means about God? It means his muchness, his weightiness, his power. And when we give glory to God, we're just acknowledging that he's worthy of glory. We're giving him the praise that is due to him. Verse 21, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. This is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. That's the kind of faith that Abraham had. And so, so many of us read these stories and we think, well, the story sounds great. I'm glad things worked out for him. You know, I'm glad that he's a hero of the faith, but what I really need to know right now is who, who cares about what, what God did then if he's not doing it now? But these stories were written for our sake as examples that we are trust in the same God who's supernaturally working today 
in us, creating out of nothing something, raising the deadness that's in us. There are no barriers to God and his promises for you. So what's in the story for me? Scripture is, is, is God-centered, true, but it's never without human application. Like sometimes we take that, you know, it's not about you a little too far in our, in our preaching. God didn't create the universe because he needed it. God didn't give all these promises because he needed them. God did that for you because he loved you. So what's in this story for us? And the answer to the question is found in verse 23. It says, but, but the words that it was counted to him were not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our just justification. The story of Abraham is our story. The promises to Abraham are our promises if we have faith like Abraham. So the question is, what kind of faith did Abraham have? What does saving faith look like? Verse 14, we read it. Abraham believed in the God who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Abraham believed that God had the power to accomplish all his promises. That's what it means to have saving faith. <clears throat> So if Paul had a question for you right now, it might be this. If God can raise Jesus from the dead, could he not also strengthen your weakness and fulfill his promises for you? Does he not have the means to do that for you? Could not his glorious power that strengthened the old, the nearly dead Abraham, help you to stand? Could not the same glorious power help you to persevere trials like Abraham persevered of old? He can. So if God can raise the dead, then he can certainly give strength to you in your life for the trials of your life. This is what it means to have faith like Abraham. And, and the reality is you literally lack the ability to follow God in his ways. You are barren. You lack strength. So God creates it out of nothing and he gives it to you. You, you, you lack the power to, to keep his word and he gives you the strength to do that by his spirit. He creates what's not in us. He creates it in us. He, he creates it out of nothing. Do you know before you were saved, it says Romans 6, Romans 8, 6 through 8, it says that the, that the person who's of the flesh says these things, is, is hostile to the law of God. He is unable to keep the law of God. He's unable to please God. But then you receive the spirit. And what did God do? He created out of nothing the new nature and the new abilities that you didn't lack, that you once lacked. He, he gave that to you. You didn't have that. He created that out of nothing in you. The same way he created the world out of nothing. The same way he gave a child out of nothing for Abraham. God can command the strength you need into existence. God gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. That's why Paul, what, what Paul just said, and this is why Abraham persevered. So Abraham's story is ultimately the story of God's faithfulness and power, which is why I said Brad's message is so important to what we're saying here that God keeps his promises and here we're reading that God is able to keep his promises it's critical to our understanding of Romans 5 1 through 5 so before we go into Romans 5 1 through 5 now I'm sitting here saying that's our main text and we spend an awful lot of time like in the preliminaries or in the academia academic world, they always like to say the prolegomena. I'm like, why can't we just say an introduction, you know, in class? 
So here's, here's four truths that I want you to take with you as we go into Romans 5, okay? Truth number one is this, that God's promises to Abraham are your promises. It wasn't just written for us to go, isn't that great that Abraham had things work out for him? God's saying, it's going to work out for you too. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it happen. I don't see any way. I'm going to make the way. I don't have the strength. I'm going to give you the strength. So God's promises to Abraham are your promises, number one. Number two, the God of Abraham is your God. And he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So the God of Abraham is your God. So everything that's true about God in the Old Testament, everything that's true about God in the New Testament, which is the same God, is true about God today. So the God of Abraham is your God. Number three, the God of Abraham has the power to keep his promises, which is the point that Brad made so well in his last message. Why do I keep saying that? Because I want you, if you didn't hear the message, to go back on YouTube, youtube.com slash gospel first, look at Brad's message and the faithful promise keeper. That is the background to Paul's argument in Romans 5. And fourth point is, Abraham's faith was faith in God's promises and abilities. And that's what your faith needs to look like. Not just that, yeah, I believe the gospel is true. Yeah, I believe that God has promises. But do you really believe, believe that he can accomplish that for you? Not just in the life to come, but he's doing it now. He's, he's creating in you what you need to walk down the same path, to grow in righteousness, to grow in usefulness, to build one another up, to take the gospel to the world. He's doing that right now in us. Now our main text, Romans 5. Verse 1, therefore. Pause there. Whenever you see a therefore, we need to ask what the therefore is there for, right? Right? Therefore what? Therefore, in light of all these truths that Paul labored so hard to establish for us. Therefore, because we have faith in the same God Abraham had. Therefore, because God, that God is the same God who kept his promises, will keep his promises for us. That God is our God because of that, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith. Just like Abraham, Paul just said that. We have peace with God. Not just him, we have it. The same God through our Lord Jesus Christ, verse two, through whom we have also obtained access by faith into this grace. That we have also, if you keep everything in the story of Abraham in mind, you understand that's why Paul's saying, we have also received this. We have also obtained access by faith in this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So we rest in the same life-creating, strength-giving, sovereign God Abraham did, just like Abraham did. So what did Abraham trust about God? He believed that God was able to keep his promises. This Romans 4, 20 through 22. Abraham grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced of what? That God was able to do what he had promised. And notice what Paul says this in verse 22. This is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. He didn't just believe that God existed. He didn't just believe that maybe these stories are true, but he believed that God was able to keep his promises. And that's why God said, I am declaring you righteous. So the question that we need to ask ourselves is, does that describe our faith? Does that describe your faith? God is able to do everything he promised for you. That God will certainly create out of nothing the things that you need when it's according to his purposes in time. He'll give it to you just as you need it. 
And that doesn't mean there won't be times like Abraham, where after Abraham told your wife Sarah is going to have a child, that you won't have times of wondering, and you won't try maybe striving in your own power and failing. It doesn't mean that you don't have true faith. Because what does Jesus say? How much faith does he need? If you have faith as small as a mustard seed. It's all he needs. And then God will work with that. You know, we'll give the analogy of how much faith do you need of a tsunami's coming in, you're on the beach, the big dead tree over here, and, and this 2,000-foot rocky mountain to your right, or for you guys, to your left. And it's a 100-foot tsunami coming in. And, I, and, and there's three people that are there, and one person says, you know what? I have full confidence this dead tree is going to hold me, so I'm going to climb up in that. And then there's two people, one with great faith in the Rocky Mountain, the other one who's like, I'm not so sure, but you know what? I think, I think I trust that a little more than the dead tree. And so they both together go up in the Rocky Mountain. The waves come in. The man of the dead tree perishes because of what he trusted in could not withstand the waves. And the two people, the one with the strong faith and the one with the weak faith, were saved the same. How? Because it's not about how much faith you have, but it's about the object of your faith. So even if you have a small amount of faith, if you put it in the rock that is God, you will stand. That's all God needs. Because it's not about the strength of your faith, your faith, it's about the strength of him who is able to deliver on his promises. So is there even just an inkling of faith that you have right now that you can just put in the God who is our rock? That's all God needs. And you can see this kind of the faith that Abraham had. Because he has moments of doubts too, just like us. But he had enough faith. And that faith was in who? God himself. And God keeps his promises. But why is it so hard to trust God like this? I mean, why, why is it? And I'm afraid that many Reformed churches like ours have a tendency to take the story of the Bible and we treat them like there's some archaeological find that we just dug up and we're going to discuss. Like, this is the way it used to be. See this marble? This is, this is what this, this God used to be like. And we memorize a bunch of facts about him and, and we think, that's great. It, it happened, but it's not happening now. You know, we get the stuffy, stodgy, stoic God that we preach to the world. It's not able to save. But God says, I'm the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Our God today is the true and living God. And because he's the living God, verse 3 says this. It says, not only that, but we, like Abraham, rejoice in our suffering. Not always your best, you know, good news verse of the day. <laughs> hey, you get to rejoice in your suffering. What? Why do we rejoice in our suffering? Because like Abraham, we know God will use it. So not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings like Abraham, knowing that suffering produces what? Endurance. Great. Now I have to endure suffering? <laughs> but that's not the end of it. Think about it. As God rescues his people, Israel, where does he first bring them? Through the wilderness. And what, what do they need to do? They just need to endure on this short path to the promised land. And they give up while they're in the middle of the wilderness. 
And we do that too, because suffering comes, our wilderness moment comes, and what do we do? We give up. And God's like, no, you don't understand. This is not my final destination for you. I'm taking you somewhere. Go with me. Come on. Go with me. I have a promised plan for you. And this is just a temporary wilderness that I'm taking you through. It's on the way. But promise me, trust me, trust me. I'm taking you somewhere good. So we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance what? Produces character and character produces hope. Notice the word produces. You want hope? Then when suffering and trials come, endure it. And if you endure it, that'll produce character. And if you grow in character, you're going to have the hope that you want. God says, I want to give you hope. This is my path for you. If you're going through the wilderness with Israel and you just kept going and persevering and eventually you would see the promised land, you'd be like, I see it. I see it coming because I'm, I'm drawing near to it. I'm seeing the promises of God more clearly. Though I'm not there yet, I see it more clearly than I ever have. And now I have hope because I know that what God is doing has a point. And sometimes we don't have hope because we lack character and we lack character because we don't endure the trials. But instead, we, we, want, to get rid of the, we want to get rid of the trials. And what is that like? It's like the person who wants strong muscles but doesn't want to lift the weights. God has his appointed means and we do not get to choose others. But we endure his trials for our good like Abraham. So suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. So if you want endurance, you're going to have to face the trials of your life, the barren moments, the weakness of your life, and trust that God has a plan for it. He's the true and living God. You'll you'll be like, I don't see how they could possibly accomplish what I what I need, but God's like, I'll I'll make it happen. It's not there, but I'm going to create it as you move along and follow in my steps. I'm going to make it happen. So sometimes we really struggle with character because we refuse to believe that God can use our suffering for our good. So if we want hope, what do we do? We embrace the suffering that produces endurance, that produces character, that produces hope. And embracing suffering is step one. Like every race, it has the first step. And if we don't take the first step, then we're not even in the race. We're not even going to the finish line. And trusting in God's power and promises is the key to embracing suffering. And to help you trust in God, Paul reminds us of Abraham's story. That's the background behind our promises. Same God, same power, same destination, same hope. This is the God of Abraham. This is our God. He's the raising from the dead God. He's the creating out of nothing God. He's opening what you can't open, so he gets the glory. But he's also going to do it for your good. So let me just close with some verses, just thinking and remembering that we serve the same God, and he has his good in mind for us. Just rest in his, in his goodness, rest in his power. And I want you to just hear, this is how Paul thinks as he's trying to bless the churches that he, he speaks to. to. To the Ephesians, he, he writes this. And I'm just going to read it, not going to comment. We're going to close. Now to him 
who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations, forever and ever, amen. Or Philippians 1, 6 through 7, that I am sure of this, that he, the God of Abraham, who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And it is right for me to feel this way about all of you because I hold you in my heart for why. You are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. So go today in the power of God, trusting that he is able to accomplish all that you need. He is more than able to do it. Rest in that. May that be what your faith looks like, because that is our saving faith. Rest in the God who is our rock, and you will stand.